Yeah, everybody needs a translation. I'm going to talk in German, my mother tongue. <laughs> So, ich glaube, alle sind jetzt ausgestattet. I think everyone is well equipped with hats out and uh, we can start off. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, guests, I would like to welcome you very much to our conference at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, uh, Monopoly in Africa. I would like to welcome you very much and delighted that so many of you have come here. I am, um, I can tell you that there is a fierce competition of other events taking place tonight. And we are delighted that so many of you have come here in spite of the beautiful weather outside. I think it's really worth it. And you will be given quite a program tonight. I think we can truly say that the African continent has never been before been so high on the agenda of German politics. The federal government in all the different ministries is dealing with plans on how to help Africa overcome its crises, make it more prosperous. And even the fact that Africa is been given more attention is a very positive fact in itself. This conference and many contributions on our website sets the objective to focus more closely on the so-called Africa year of the federal government and the rediscovery of the African continent, also in the politics of Japan, China, Europe, and above all, the G20. The G20 is the club of the richest industrialized and emerging countries, 19 plus the European Union. Germany currently has the presidency of the G20 and Africa will be one of the central topics on the federal government agenda. As I already said, we are delighted about this new attention being given or being paid to Africa. This conference is to look more closely and critically on the objectives and intentions of these large plans. It can never be wrong to critically look at the plans, and that's why we organized this conference tonight and in particular tomorrow with all the experts. As Heinrich Böll Foundation, we are above all interested in the African perspective. We would like to know what all the different players from the African countries think, in particular those where we work as a foundation. We want to learn about their ideas on a social ecological and sustainable development. Will uh, or are the African players being heard when our governments launches plans such as the Marshall Plan, Compact with Africa, and, and the international stage? That is one of the questions we will be addressing during the course of the conference. I am therefore particularly delighted that I am able to welcome so many of our African guests who are here tonight and will be attending tomorrow in the different panels and de public debates. I would like to welcome the guests from Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, Senegal, and Cameroon. 
I would in particular like to welcome a delegation from Nigeria, from our partner organization, Nigerian Economic Summit. I am delighted that you will bring in your views and visions and your ideas of the future. You're most welcome. I would like you to welcome them all together because this is quite special. What investments do African countries truly need when growth and development are to be socially inclusive, as it's so often demanded? What does that actually mean? What does it mean when the famous 2015 Agenda 2015, the so-called Sustainable Development Goals, and the Paris Climate Agreement are taken serious? What does it mean if these agreements should be more than just lip service. Are they truly the leading ideas for the plans of the compact with Africa? Or do we see two different worlds? On the one hand, an old paradigm of development policy, and on the other hand, the Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. It is now the end of May. We are right in our so-called Africa year, as the federal government calls 2017. Before I come to the different plans and how we assess them so far, I would like to, to take this opportunity to briefly look at current challenges and problems of many African countries. 34 out of the 50 poorest countries in the world are located on the African continent. For many millions of people, this means that they have no access to clean drinking waters or sanitary facilities for, or even electricity. They don't have or not sufficient access to education and health. There is a basic lack of uh, with the preconditions for living a life in dignity. 12.4 million people uh, are refugees within the continent. 5.4 million are f on the flight trying to build up a new life outside Africa. All of them, and they're so-called internally displaced, but also those trying to reach Europe are uh, and in dire straits and are uh, poorly equipped with all they need to provide for their livelihood. We should also be aware of the fact that African countries are disproportionately um, affected by climate change and see a number of climate disasters today. Um, Somalia, Nigeria, Southern Sudan, and Yemen s currently see a hunger crisis which are exacerbating rapidly. About 20 million people are threatened by a famine. Stephen O'Brien, the coordinator of the United Nations, warns that the world is about to face the greatest humanitarian disaster since the Second World War. He appealed to the global community to become active since the country's concerns are um, unable to act or not willing to act. The United Nations need $4.4 billion by, the, by June this year, and only 10% have been funded so far, or have pledged so far. We need help as soon as possible, and the G20, in particular under G the German presidency, will have to take a clear possession on the massive crisis in Africa. I think it is cynical to talk about large master plans and a compact with Africa while no one is really trying to overcome the humanitarian crisis and to understand it as the most important act of solidarity and humanity. So far, the Western governments are failing. The G7 have quite nicely documented that they are not willing to pledge commitment to the United Nations. And I think it's up to us to 
live up to our demands. We have as rich nations to introduce them into the debate and not only talk about the plans I will address in a moment. We all know that there's great political instability in Africa, and a civil war in many countries. Terrorist militias are spreading, thinking of Libya, Egypt, and Nigeria. And the Democratic Republic of Congo is increasingly being forgotten, although there has been a, a fight for land and resources for decades. 2.7 million people have been expelled, massacres and attacks of the civil population are common and every day. The World Health Organization just informed that a new Ebola crisis br broke out in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In view of these tragedies, it is high time that the rich and powerful of the G20 finally make it their priority to overcome this, um, these disasters by sufficient humanitarian aid. The United Nations needs sufficient funds to be able to be become a true humanitarian player. When we think of peacemaking and the stability of the continent, we will have to think about our contribution to the issues at stake. We will have to think of whom we supply we with weapons. We will have to think about trade agreements, policies which ensure in the long term that the countries of the continent become more stable, develop more stable political systems, better healthcare systems, and better political systems. Do no harm is a maxim which we know from development cooperation. Do no harm from our view, from our responsibility would be a good starting point to establish trust for all political initiatives with Africa. I would now like to come to my assessment of the different plans launched by the federal government. Above all, the question um, whether the plans of the federal government are a solution or can be panacea for the problems of the African population, whether they create jobs, give a positive outlook on Ceuta, master plan with Africa, compact with Africa, initiative pro Africa, a G20 conference in June in Berlin, the G20 summit in June, a EU, EU summit dealing with Africa in November. We tend to lose. Uh, track of all the different initiatives of the federal government, one after the other. At federal level, in Berlin, on our front door, we have to ask for coherence. Do the individual ministries know what's going on in the others? Do they coordinate their plans? Who coordinates what? Who is in the lead and responsible for what plan? And what is also important for the overall debate within the G20 format, we have such a broad variety in Germany. What about coordination with other EU countries who all have their own Africa plans? The European Union is one of the largest players in development cooperation, and we all know that China and Japan recently publish new plans to further develop Africa. So what we see is a major issue of coordination and agreement with other partners. And one of my questions to the African partners is to our African guests is how African institutions, weak in their majority, are to cope with this run on their countries in view of the weak resources they have. We know from other initiatives that there are often major difficulties in coordinating and agreeing the different initiatives. I would like to know from my African guests how 
they see this problem of institutional capacities on the spot and whether a lot has changed in recent years in view uh, of institutions in Africa. To further develop the growth potential, all the plan says, um, it, it, all the plan says it's their utmost aim to further the growth potential on the African continent. And they also say they linked up to the African perspective and the African wishes. I think this sounds reasonable, but does the federal government's Africa policy and the EU's Africa policy also mean to conclude migration agreements and to lead talks with African governments to stop migration from Africa to Europe? Indeed, it does. Um, we They are struggling about how to achieve these objectives. Not only the Heinrich Böll Foundation, but many other NGOs dealing with refugees ask whether it is reasonable to fight the causes of flight by means of development aid, because after all, it's a question of methods and means. And the question arises whether the Marshall Plan is not being instrumentalized to cut us off from these flows of migrants. Are these reasonable ideas to achieve a um, future-oriented development oriented to the people? The new policy of the federal government pursues the logic that more investment in the African infrastructure will be a solution. Well, there's no doubt that the continent urgently needs investment in infrastructure at all levels of society. Infrastructure is an obstacle to growth today, and the continent needs infrastructure so that people can live a life in dignity. But I think we have to think about what kind of infrastructure we're talking about. And that is what we will be asking today and tomorrow. Is it infrastructure for education and health, for social security, democratic institutions that undermine corruption? Is it infrastructure that provides basic services for people, infrastructure that creates jobs and we should also address the question how the current infrastructure should look like, in particular that infrastructure that is to enable trade. What should it look like to actually generate growth jobs, but also contributes to avoiding further um, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. So do all these infrastructure plans provide an answer on how Africa is to develop, um, or deal with the SDGs and the climate objectives? This also includes questions of infrastructure for mobility between urban and rural areas, countries and regions that are to promote the very important interregional trade. Railroad or car is also an important question, in particular for African regions that want to better network. It is not about talking that we uh, don't need any roads, but it's about striking a balance where long distance transport is possible, uh, as well as uh, public transport in collapsing African cities. There's a question that are very dear to our heart as a, a political foundation of the Green Party. Leading African economists have calculated for the G20 that African countries have a need of 93 billion US dollars per year to establish the basic infrastructure in a way that it is no longer an obstacle to growth.
because a lack of infrastructure is an obstacle to growth in Africa. And that is what we need. We have to look at what kind of infrastructure we need to launch trade, to promote exchanges between cities and regions. It is of the essence, something we need, miss in the debate in Germany. We have to see how to best spend the billions of dollars. Equally important is the question of where the money actually comes from. How are the 93 billion, mil, uh, billion US dollars per year acquired? Do these plans for Africa think about um, acquiring the infrastructure funds by means of taxes? I think it's very important because most of the African countries don't have any tax systems. The elites and the growing middle class is not currently contributing to uh, establishing infrastructure to the common good. I think that's very important. It would be an important reform step to think about such taxation systems. Are the funds being raised by development aid or by obtaining loans with foreign banks, which would also raise the questions for debts? Because I remember very well that in the 1980s and 90s, large part of the African countries were massively in debt and were on the, the uh, looking into the abyss in terms of social and economic uh, affairs. So these questions will have to be debated on a broad basis. The German Marshall Plan and the Compact, as well as the large G20 initiatives, primarily focus on mobilizing private capital, that is, providing attractive investment conditions. Specifically, they aim at reducing red tape, establishing free markets, and giving room for economic action to um, also about skilled staff, uh, the rule of law, property rights, and uh, smoothly running financial institutions. I focus on the magic wand in all these plans and the magic wands to mobilize capital uh, to finance the infrastructure projects are public-private partnerships. To briefly explain what it is, it means that public funds, taxes, or development aid are being invested together with institutionalized um, donors, uh, such as pension funds, etc., to jointly fund projects. The state does not only provide public funds, but also has other tools. Uh, they, it in particularly secures the investment risks of private investors. Hamas guarantees in Germany, the guarantees of the International Finance Corporation, IFC, which is part of the World Bank Group. I think this is a dangerous path to focus on PPPs alone. For decades, we have focused on public-private partnerships all around the world. The World Bank has evaluated the models, and apparently, this evaluation is not being taken into account uh, in these new plans that focus on public-private partnerships. Another important aspect for us is to, um, to critically look at, at the funding models of private, public-private partnerships because quite often uh, the funds go to profitable projects and not only, not necessarily to those that are publicly needed. The reasoning that public funds will never suffice to provide for all the large scale infrastructure that's needed in Africa, and that's without any doubt correct because the public purse will not be able to fund. $93 billion, and that is why the public sector is needed. What is important to us is the public-private partnerships um, focus, um, use public money to identify bankable projects, in particular in the infrastructure 
area. That is projects that uh, make profit. The public purse and the governments in Germany or in Africa should say for these public-private partnership models that together with, with the private players, they debate on promoting public goods with these models. That would be a good approach. However, what we see all across the world is that the public purse, the government, does not benefit of the leveraging effect uh, of combining public money with private funds. They do not necessarily use the, le the leveraging effect to invest in basic infrastructure. When we look at specific investment plans, we see that bankable projects usually lead to gigantic projects, um, da electricity dams, motorways, oil pipelines, ports, and airports. Of course, this is needed, but do we have to provide uh, public funds? These large-scale projects, we have many examples which are published on our website. Quite often, these large-scale projects destroy ecosystems. They continue the dependence on fossil energies, and people are disowned and displaced by due to these large-scale projects. Uh, there's a n growing number of such projects in Africa. And if the, unless there's a better public control, the large master plans of the world uh, will be implemented there. To us, in decisive questions, to, uh, when we critically look at these infrastructure projects, who invests, for what purpose, who benefits, who pays, and are these decisions being taken democratically? And after all, a point I'd like to repeat, if we want to um, implement the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Objectives, this should be the header overarching all other investment plans for Africa. However, what we see is that nice projects are being done for Sustainable Development Goals while infrastructure policy and a change of the development at paradigm of the 1980s uh, lets us doubt that this is future oriented and above all that it is an answer to my initial question whether it actually contributes to establishing basic infrastructure, uh, health, education, the basic rights of the population. The federal government is undertaking major efforts to stress that these are plans with Africa, not for Africa. And insiders, I believe, know nonetheless that plans for, uh, with Africa have been developed at the desks in the German ministries. And when we closely look at the plans, we cannot see whether they have actually been developed in cooperation with African partners. The Marshall Plan, for example, sounds as if we diagnosed what all African countries need. It has nothing to do with ownership and partnership, but rather with our ideas of how uh, development processes in Africa should come about. That is why I would clearly like to say there's a lot of free capital that's looking for new investments in the global south. And it is very practical if new public-private partnerships come up and such large infrastructure projects, because they appeal to investors in Germany. The Marshall Plan clearly relates to the 2063 strategy of the African Union. But the African Union 
strategy does not say that African countries are actually looking for partnerships with European countries. I think this clearly shows what I would like to address. Where do the priorities come from? Okay, I admit that step by step we seem to try to catch up with participation of African decision makers, not to speak of participation of the African population, which is not being included, not involved in the deals of the African governments. So, compact with Africa. To me, that means above all that unfair asymmetric trade relations are being ended. After all, Germany's foreign trade with the African continent last year was 41 billion euros. But the balance of forces of international trade policy is not based on partnership. Definitely not. We can still blame one-sided and unfair agricultural policy and fishery policy in the European Union for destroying the local farmers, the fisheries, small-scale fisheries. It is being di discussed in Germany, but I don't see any approach to achieve resources to do away with the um, imbalance to reach better trade relations. That's something we do not see in the in the government's plans. We want to make use of this conference to debate with our African partners on how they deal with this growing interest of other countries in their African countries. Are they being involved? Can they introduce their ideas in into these new plans? There's a lot of hype about Africa. We know that we've seen many of these plans or schemes. I couldn't name them all. I'm not going to. We've seen master plans, the Lagos plan of action for the continent. Today, we know what the outcomes are. We would like to know from our guests whether Africa actually needs our plans, whether there are no other good plans that should be implemented. I have raised a number of questions in my introductory statement. I hope that you, the guests from Africa, as well as all of you here, can contribute today and tomorrow to making us a bit wiser after one and a half conference days, giving us ideas on how to truly develop a partnership between Germany, Africa, and the European Union, how to exchange and learn from one another. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. This is our only, my only opportunity before I introduce Carlos Lopez. I would therefore now like to thank very much all those who contributed to this conference today and tomorrow. Above all, our Africa division, which helped us to bring so many exciting guests here, all the discussants. I would like to thank Claudia Simons, who took the lead in organizing this conference. And of course, we have offices in Senegal, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa. I would like to thank our offices that are all contributed and worked with all these people in the run up to the conference. A very heartfelt thank you to all of you. Sometimes you're really proud of your staff, and I am. We have an excellent map link, in particular of our Nigerian office. You have at least nine YouTube statements which explain how business, civil society, entrepreneurs, etc., 
what they think of development in Africa. It is extremely interesting to look at that. So make use of our website and all the material available there. Make use of our publication. There's a lot on offer, which is great. I thank you for your hand. I am now delighted to finally be able to introduce Carlos Lopez. Carlos Lopez in the past headed a number of UN institutions, most recently the e United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and I also like to read their findings. He has recently become a member of the reform team of the African Union and is professor at Cape Town University. He is also a member of Invest Africa, a network of private investors located in London. And he, to open our conference, he will give us our a keynote address. I uh, am delighted that afterwards Petra Pinsler, journalist and editor with the weekly Die Zeit, will lead us through this evening and also through the day tomorrow. I would like to ask Carlo Lopez to take the floor, and I am delighted uh, to have you here. I'm looking forward to an interesting conference, and in particular to your contribution. Well, good afternoon to all of you. I really would like to thank you. It's my turn for uh, coming here during a day that is quite busy and uh, with good weather. Actually, it's not that good because it's just starting to rain. Uh, Barbara, you have been very kind in your introduction. And I really would like to thank you for the invitation and through you, the fantastic team of the foundation that has put this event together. I'm very happy to see many Africans also attending. And in anticipation, I would like to thank Petra for the moderation that she's going to offer. Um, you know, I was uh, listening to you, Barbara, and in the translation equipment, I saw that it is marked engineered and quality by Bosch but made in China. <laughs> and you know, it's a bit the paradox that uh, I was talking in another event, that we have to deal with uh, a distribution of the chain, not the way we more or less got used to, which is the chain of production of objects, but now we are also dealing with the chain of knowledge. And we are commoditizing knowledge. Uh, today, we have about 60% of the African population that doesn't have an ID card. And yet, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg and his Facebook probably know more about the movements of the people uh, that don't have ID cards, some, than the registry uh, of these countries do. We are going into a direction where the disruptions technologically and otherwise are so vast that we have to prepare for a completely different take in the way we analyze any geographical reality, and Africa is no exception. But when it comes to Africa, the deficit of knowledge is so huge that we have to make an extra effort not to help, not to assist, but just to understand, because we think we know what we really don't know. So I want to start with some figures that are just going to contextualize how far most of the perceptions are, and I'm sure you are the exception, but how far most of the perceptions are in relation to reality. Let's say that we are talking about aid to Africa, which is a very topical subject. Well, it is around $52 billion a year. About 16, 17 years ago, the turn of the century, it was the same amount. So it has not increased 
There are little variations, but it's more or less the same amount. In the same period, the collection of taxes in Africa has gone from about 63 billion to 600 billion. So which means that if we increase by 1% the efficiency of the tax collection, we get more money than development aid. 1% more. So it shouldn't be that difficult for Africans to actually find that money. But guess what is the reality? The reality is that you have a number of countries that depend sometimes up to 80% of one commodity, export earnings, and that's what the government deals with. That's the money they have for public spending. They don't really relate their fiscal machinery to the reality of their economy. It's like two different realities. You know, take a country like uh, Nigeria. Uh, we have lots of Nigerians in the room. The oil sector today represents 10% of GDP, just 10%. But Nigeria is completely crippled because of the price of oil. How come? It's only 10% of GDP because the earnings of the state are completely based on oil, which means that the economy is not really related to the fiscal reality. Unfortunately, despite this incredible progress I just mentioned on tax collection, what I didn't say, and I did it on purpose, is that the economies of the continent have also grown exponentially. So it is normal that we are now at the 600 billion. But we are not doing OK at all. Because the fiscal pressure, which is the way we measure how much the fiscus get from the size of the economy, in Africa is about 17%. That's the continental average. And in the world, that average is 35%. So you see the gap. And that gap is despite the fact that we have been growing. In fact, I will tell you one story about Africa's growth. Africa is growing at the rates, if you compound you know, the periods for uh, longer than one or two years, at the rates that countries like China did grow. How do I know this? Because if you look into any period of history of a particular country, it took them to double their GDP size. In Germany, you go into your statistical series, there is one period that uh, you double your GDP, it took 60 years. In Africa, we have doubled our GDP in 15 years which is the size of doubling GDP of China about 20 years ago. So when you compare this, you, you see that the reality is not one of going to beg about infrastructure investment. In fact, what is going on in terms of this 93 billion deficit of investment that is being mentioned many times? That figure, to start with, was put together six years ago. So it's completely outdated. In fact, since then, in the period of six years, Africa has actually surpassed the $100 billion annual investment in infrastructure. So in principle, we have dealt with that deficit. The issue is that the demands of the economy, because it has grown so much, are actually asking for much more infrastructure. And so if we revise the figure, we'll not be talking about 93 billion deficit. Probably we'll be talking about something that is a bit more realistic. Uh, one of the big investors in Africa infrastructure, China, uh, would basically tell you that you know, that's 100 billion. That's what they invest in one city in China. So we are talking about continent. So it should be much more. Where are we going to find the money? Well, I gave you one insight. Maybe we should have a better fiscal apparatus that will take the money from our own 
savings and our own economic activity. But is that enough? And my answer is that that is not enough. Because if you look into the history of any given country, how they build the basic infrastructure that propelled them into the industrial age, with a few exceptions, they did it with a lot of borrowing. And that borrowing explains why, for instance, the countries that are very successful in the world are also the ones that have the largest debt. We are not the ones who have the largest debt. You have the largest debt, sorry. Uh, Japan has 200% GDP debt. Uh, OECD average is 122%. We are struggling with 42%, and we are being considered a complete failure, 42%. In fact, when we started the structural adjustment programs, we had a debt of about 22% to GDP, we finished the structural adjustment programs with 122%. That was the contribution of structural adjustment. And then we fought back our way, partly with get debt forgiveness. But you know, if you are an economist, you know that that debt was basically um, completely uh, dead, you know, overrated. It was not market value. But never mind. So with that forgiveness in everything, we end up in 2015 with a GDP to debt ratio of about 22%. And we are climbing very fast. But we are climbing very fast, partly because there are structural programs in the, uh, pro problems in the world economy that cannot be resolved by Africa. And if there was a compact with Africa, those are the problems I would like to be resolved. I'll tell you number one problem, negative interest rates. What is negative interest rates? So you put your money in the bank in order to get less. That's what it is, right? How, how did we achieve that incredible development? We achieved it because we don't want to discuss the structural issues of the economy because we prefer to discuss the marginal issues and elevate them to become the mainstream key issues. So I'm going to uh, exemplify what I mean. If you have a population that is aging, and this population basically don't know how their future is going to look like, they are afraid of the future possibilities of risk. So the notion of risk changes. And that notion of risk changing means that you have to tighten whatever systems you have in place financially to make sure that the money is not going to vanish. So you translate this now in economic lingo. It's called banking regulations through Basel II and Basel III which is a rules-based you know, way of making sure that the financial sector is tightened. The bank's ratio of capital has to increase. And in order for it to increase and be less risky, one of the things you tell them, you have to reduce your exposure. And part of reducing that exposure is to say, get out of Africa. So the banks that are quite present in Africa are being told by the regulators you please get out of Africa, because you are with a level of exposure that will decrease your rating and will get you into trouble with the regulators. Therefore, get out of it. And the banks are getting out of it. So what is the point of discussing a compact with Africa when the banks are being told, get out of Africa? So that's one. Then, because you are afraid of the future, you don't want to discuss the aging issue, because it's not politically palatable, you get into this very phenomenal behavior of negative interest rates, which basically means that at the time where we are going to borrow, in principle, if the interest rates are negative, it should be like a super bonus for us, Africa. 
because we don't even need to pay the same money, we pay less. The only problem is that no money is lended to us because of the issues I just mentioned. So we have no access to capital. So how are we going to resolve this problem? By making sure that in this compact or some measure that is put together by the G20 or Germany or G7, we are going to address these risk perception issues and address the financial regulation issues that are going to allow capital to flow in the direction of Africa. I haven't seen anything convincing in this field. So what I see is treating this as if it was a problem of you have to believe in Africa. Well, thank you very much. You are very kind. <laughs> but the problem is that, you know, the business people don't buy that. They want to believe in profiting. And I have no problems, no quarrels, that Africa contributes to some system that also allows for those who invest, those who are present, to profit. But it has to be done within a certain number of parameters. And that's what we need to discuss. And if we were going to have a serious discussion, then we'll see that how come in a potential austerity environment with a depressed economy globally, we are not investing in the world region that has the highest return on investment. Africa has 9.2 return on investment, and the world average, not the world average, the developing countries average is 7.5. So why is the money not coming? Well, and then we come into this very interesting dimension, which is called China. Because China actually got it. They got it, and they are making, uh, basically, it's not just with Africa. They are making possible for some of the world truths, mainstream truths, to continue to prevail, despite skepticism on those who constructed those ideas and those proposals. So climate change did not come from China they were actually dead against it. Now they are the champions of it, okay? Um, fighting against protectionism, liberalization, China didn't like that at all. Now they are the champions of liberal trade. And you can go on with a number of examples, but the one that interests our discussion is that China did not really imitate, occupy the space of former colonial and other potential actors in the African continent, they, they are just being offered it in a plate. And I, I'm going to be very precise because there are lots of confusions about numbers regarding China and Africa. Normally we pull together uh, numbers about this relationship in a half-hazard way. We confuse trade, with greenfield investments, with stock of foreign direct investment, with flows of capital and loans, and you also confuse very often all of this with aid. Typically, for every $4 of infrastructure involvement of China in the continent, only $1 comes from China. The other three are actually built by Chinese companies because they basically win the bids. Money comes from different sources, but they win the bids. And the reason why we have this perception of overwhelming presence is because they are winning a lot of bids. And they are winning a lot of bids because they have excessive capacity on uh, construction and uh, public works. They need to maintain their employment in these areas. And the best way for them to maintain it is to make sure that they put part of this excessive capacity in Africa. It can be for 
money that they have sponsored themselves, not concessional money, but just you know normal commercial lending, or it can be because they win bids. What is wrong with that? Uh, there is a, a screaming about you know China occupying Africa. I say when I hear that, I say, oh, is that because they are our number one trading partner? But they are also the number one trading partner of the U.S. and Brazil and Indonesia, and I don't know how many countries in Europe. So what is the problem when it's Africa? All of a sudden, it's strange. Why? Because some have a claim, territorial claim, that Africa should not be the territory of liberal free trade. So I welcome. In fact, I condemn China for not putting enough, because I think that they should put much more on investment and much less on trade in order for the relationship to be more balanced. And when they announce sometimes, like in the last uh, forum for China-Africa, 60 billion additional money of investment, you know, nobody keeps really the data and, and the monitoring of these amounts to make sure that it's actually a different type of uh, support than the one that uh, they claim it is. So for me, the debate is skewed towards perceptions that are, to start with, wrong. And because the perceptions are wrong, we don't see Africa from the eyes of opportunities and also from the framing of the discussion from an African perspective. So I normally uh, like to propose that we look into uh, basically three types of changes that may contribute to uh, this perception correction. The first change is actually a change about how we should handle the issue of um, risks, the risk perception. That is a, is a job mostly for Africans to start but where other partners of Africa have a long way also to go. And maybe the G20 can take this on and can propose changes that are significant. For instance, we have all these problems that are relating to the value chains and how they have basically not created opportunities for Africa to transform most of its commodities. Uh, I like to say that I'm not looking for Africa to produce the Toblerone and Godiva. I'm looking for I'm I'm looking for cocoa paste, because if you if you were producing cocoa paste, which is just one segment of the chain, you can conserve the product, and you would not be in a situation like this year, where two African countries that produce 60 percent of the world cocoa, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, are experiencing a big crisis because they are at the worst in terms of prices in the last 10 years. And the companies that are dealing with chocolate are at their best in terms of profit. Why? Because they can play with the prices because we don't transform even the, the cocoa into the cocoa paste. And this is true almost for everything. All the commodities, if you just add about 10% va value addition, you will be able to actually offer 7 million additional jobs to the continent every year. We are not talking about transforming us into builders of rockets. We just want like the translation equipment there. It can continue to be engineered and quality German but made in Africa, I would be happy with 10% value addition. And I think this, this, this is the element that will change the risk perception, is when we are actually very specific about the value chains and it's not a generic debate. Because these generalities we are very much used to. Let's take four or five very important commodities for the continent, those who represent 60% of our earnings, and add for each one of them what it takes for the value chain to be partly owned by Africa. It's very simple, very specific. If I see it in a communique of the G20, I will applaud. 
But this lingo, like you are used to, doesn't go anywhere. The second is this uh, change of um, uh, alliances. As I mentioned, uh, we have grown in terms of the trade relations, relationships quite well. But the most important relationship for Africa is still not there. And that is the regional integration within Africa. Because that's the one that is going to create most opportunities for the economic transformation of the continent and for its industrialization. When I say industrialization, I don't mean very simplistically that we are going to build the kind of factories that are being delocalized from more developed regions at a time where the robots will, com will compete with us and automation. I'm talking about the systems of production, the organization of the economy that is commensurate with industrial age. And in most countries in Africa, we are not yet there. And that is what will create opportunities for increased productivity, including in the primary sector, including in different areas. And I think it's going to be absolutely fundamental for us, if we are going to do that, to have regional integration. Because that is going to create the markets that are going to position Africa differently. In fact, just to give you an illustration of how far this can go, you know that the G20 has a representative of the European Union. It's not a country, it's an organization. Nobody questions it. It's absolutely natural, isn't it? Well, what about if I tell you that the African Union members together have a GDP that will place them in the top seven? Would you accept that they should also have a natural seat in the G20? Even more, a natural seat in the G7? Nobody accepts this. Why? Because the regional integration is not visible and effective for us to claim such an opportunity. Even with the numbers that we have today, it would have been possible. But the continental free trade area that is being discussed would create even more opportunities. So this is a fundamental prerequisite for us to actually change and transform our economic reality. And finally, the last one that I really want to share with you is the issue of how we deal with the, the correction uh, of um, uh, the correction of our uh, political governance. And this is a very important point because it gets really simplified. It gets simplified because we always see Africa from the prism of security and migration. Security and migration. Security and migration. What is not said in the communique of the G7 where luckily Africans got one paragraph, paragraph 26. <laughs> um, and it's probably going to be repeated more or less, maybe with more paragraphs in the G20 communique, is completely centered in the preoccupation about security and migration, although it doesn't say by its name. This is not a way of looking at us. It's not a way of looking at us, first, because it's completely erroneous from just an analytical point of view. Africans that migrate outside Africa, I keep repeating, are about two million per year outside Africa. Chinese that migrate outside of China, and I'm comparing Africa with China because China has more people than Africa, okay? And it's growing, 10, now 7%. It's about 10 million a year. Nobody questions how come there are 10 million Chinese that despite their growth are getting out of China. Maybe because of human rights, they say. And we question the 2 million that are getting out of Africa, and we say it's because of conflict and poverty. 
Conflict and poverty. Is it? Is it? Some of the people that are actually going out of the continent are definitely moving because of poverty and conflict. But is it all of them? I'm not so sure about it. Neither am I sure that if Africa continues to grow and even grow more, this will stop. I think it actually will accelerate. Remember that during the Marshall Plan, since it's a la mode to mention Marshall Plan, Europe was benefiting from huge inflows of capital and great, uh, growth rates in some of the countries in Europe were above 6%, like in Italy, and they were migrating massively outside Italy, despite 6% growth. So make no mistake, the fact that Africa is going to grow or not grow has nothing to do with human mobility. You have to understand human mobility from a much more complex framework. And the same happens with security. Who is ready to believe that the number of casualties in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia is a very prominent growth area. The number of casualties in Southeast Asia is larger, according to the Uppsala records on conflict uh, casualties, which are the best in the world, is larger than West Africa if you exclude Boko Haram. Larger. Who is ready to believe that the number of homicides in Rio de Janeiro is larger than the number of casualties in the Great Lakes region? Do they have a UN mission there, peacekeeping in Rio de Janeiro, or peacekeeping in Southeast Asia? They don't. And part is because, again, we are in this trap of perceptions and the way Africa is infantilized. It's never taken seriously. And because we don't have one, per, one member in the Security Council, like China, that can stop North Korea being discussed by the Security Council, or the Rohingya being discussed in the Security Council. They are not discussed because China will not allow. Where is the African equivalent? It's not there. So the issue of voice is very important. We cannot trade and say, because of efficiency, let's meet at the G7 and sort out the world economy, or let's meet at the G20 and we make it more inclusive. In both of them, Africa is largely absent. And they are discussing things that concern us. We don't want to be there as guests, because guests means you have to receive an invitation. And that invitation actually changes depending on which leader you got. You know, if this is a, a leader that, you know, it's not likable, the invitation goes to your neighbor. That's what happens. So we have to be able to say things as they are. And when we discuss governance, human rights, these issues have also to be part of the discussion. I'm not saying they are not important, but they are part of the discussion. So we are not infantilized, and people don't deal with these kind of problems that are quite serious. In Africa, differently from what they would deal in Southeast Asia, they would deal with the Mindanao conflict, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard that Mr. Duterte has been uh, mentioned in the International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, sorry. And everybody knows what is going on in the Philippines. So that's the difference. And it's a difference that the Africans got tired. So when they are invited to be part of all these compacts, they love it. Why? We love the attention. I would have missed if I didn't come to Berlin and in the year of Africa. I mean, it would definitely been a disaster. <laughs> I'm here. But I have to make really that an opportunity to say things. And that's what I'm trying to do. So we all do respect, Barbara. I'm going to correct one figure that you gave, just as an example. You quoted, so it's not your figure, so rest in peace. <laughs> 
You quoted the UN, and I used to work with the UN until a few months ago, saying that we are going to witness this year the worst famine since Second World War. That's what the UN said. And it touched people like you. Is it true? It's a complete lie. It's a complete fallacy. And why is it? Well, there are very good intentions why this is proclaimed. The intentions is that, yes, we have a drought. People are suffering. There is a fatigue of contributing to humanitarian response. So you need to do something dramatic for people to react. And with the best of intentions, someone concocted this line. Nobody got into the detail of actually verifying whether it was true by number of victims, by whatever criteria. You just go, there was, just in China, since it's a growth country, there were two famines worse than the one that is projected for this year in Africa according to the numbers that have been mentioned, which numbers nobody actually verified. But even with those numbers, seven famines were worse than this one, and two were in China. So why is it that we continue to have this kind of perceptions? Because we repeat, and the Africans have to stand out and claim their space for a different narrative. How many people are two million people. So, I, I, two million people. So I, I think it's very important for us to say that if two million people are going to die in Africa, as it is proclaimed, and you know, just one of the famines in China was 30 million, the issue is not about discussing whether humanitarian response is justified or not. Obviously it is. Obviously it is. And we have to do something about it. But we contribute indirectly for a narrative that is going to perturb the risk perception, the changes, all the things that I've just mentioned. So I hope that you, after discussions of this day and a half, will start basically questioning a lot of the numbers that are thrown at you about Africa. And to just finish with one that is my favorite, those who have listened to me two or three times are going to say I'm repetitive. There are only 12 African countries out of 54 that have their national accounts up to date. If you take into account the statistical methodological requirements that the year base should not be older than five. So I'm saying it very slowly for the non-economists. Which means that we have a huge underestimation of Africa's GDP. But even with the figures as you know them, we should be in the G7. Thank you. much. Thank you so much. I, I know there are very few people that are able to make statistics sing. Normally, um, when I hear something about statistics, it's I know it's going to be boring and, and dull. And I was pretty tired when this conference started. And you woke me up. So thanks for that. <laughs> and you really stirred up the pot. I mean, I have to admit that some of the uh, perceptions about Africa that you mentioned that I have them as well. So we should probably invite you much more often if you need any further reason to, to come to, to Berlin. It doesn't need to be the year of Africa. You, <laughs> even without having a year of Africa. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. I, I saw the, you at the other conference and we spoke briefly after the conference about being invited means that you might not be invited. So 
you want to be part of the group. And I mentioned this German say, which is that guests are like fish. They start to stink after a couple of days when they don't go. So it's a difference being part of a group and being invited. Nevertheless, the, the, the first question I have is that um, you talk about Africa. Is there such a thing like Africa? Is it, or is it OK to just talk about Africa? Because I'm asking this because when some of the, of the discussion that we are having here is that also Africa is a construction, that it's far too easy for us to talk about Africa, the dark continent, the disaster, whatsoever. Well, it's a good point. Uh, it's a social construct. It's a political construct. And it is as valid as a, na a national construct. Mm -hmm. Very often, the national construct is also somehow fabricated, you know, and it's not really uh, based on more than some very specific historical points of connection. But yet, governments uh, engage their population taking into account that particular reality. Let's say we are talking about Spain. Uh, right now, the Catalans are fighting to have their own independence or identity. And I don't know whether it's the majority of the Catalans or not. That's not my point. But it's not just the Catalans. There are a number of identities within Spain that you know consider themselves partly Spanish, but also uh, claiming their own uh, specificities and their own uh, independence within the federal construct. And it's fine with it. It's fine in Switzerland. It's fine in Belgium. It's fine in a number of countries. Why would it be any different in a situation where we are talking about a continent um, if there are points of attachment historically people can identify with and politically there is a desire? That's what makes us speak in the way we do. Mm -hmm. I do have three uh, observations that are more specifically African than what I just said that, for me, relates to any reality of this type. The first is that you know, Pan-Africanism is a very strong ideology in the continent. It has inspired the, the struggle for independence across the continent. It is a construct, if you go ideologically at these origins, it's a construct of the diaspora. So these were mostly diaspora in the Americas that started the movement of Pan-Africanism. And it has been completely adopted. There is no declaration in the last 50-something years that is not referring to Pan-Africanism. So if that is true, and there is enough capital, politically mm -hmm. and symbolically, why not speak about Africa? The second observation is that we notice that most international organizations like to divide Africa between North Africa and Sub-Saharan mm -hmm. Africa. And this, this partitioning is contrary to the ideology I just mentioned. And it is also done with a purpose. So you can see that sometimes you can influence the reality in two ways. From the inside, the Africans want to talk about Pan-Africanism. From the World Bank perspective, just to give an example, they prefer to talk about Sub-Saharan Africa. I would have no quarrels if the department in charge of Sub-Saharan Africa was called Sub-Saharan Africa Department, or the IMF uh, department was called Sub-Saharan Africa Department. It is not. It's called Africa. Why is it that you know something that you call geographically one thing actually in statistical and analytical terms is something different. And when confronted, they really don't have a very good answer. But I have an answer for them. That's a colonial divide. It's a colonial divide. And so then the we third observation. We divide you when it's, uh, when it's when convenient. It fits and we talk about Africa when, when it's convenient. OK. So we are divided when it's convenient. We are put, pulled together when it's convenient. Um, and the third observation is to say that when it comes to Africa as a construct, mm -hmm. there is normally some skepticism on the part of Africans themselves if we compare Africa with India and China, which people like me do all the time. And the reason it is convenient to do so is because it's a very unique comparator 
because from a demographic point of view, these two countries are the only ones that have more population than the continent. And we are in the same predicament they were, or are, and therefore the comparator becomes extremely appealing. So with, with excuses for you know, lumping together one continent with one, one, co one country alone, mm -hmm. you can derive a number of very interesting conclusions. Uh, like for instance, if you tell people that the star performer of the world economy, which is India, actually has less per capita income than Africa, and that has less participation in world trade than Africa, that has less cell phones than Africa, that has less foreign direct investment than Africa, that has less uh, disposable income than Africa, people say, really? And that's why the comparator becomes interesting. And then to achieve it all, you say, and who is the number one investor in India? Is it China? Is it the US? Is it Germany? I have no clue. Is it Japan? Well, those are big economies. Well, the number one investor in India is an African country, Mauritius. No, you're kidding. <laughs> I like your play with the numbers. It's really good. You could go on and go on. Let me. You asked me to to ask the uh, the, the killer questions. You asked you, you to ask your question that feel, make you feel uncomfortable. Let me try this one. During your speech, you you made the the argument that the Africans themselves don't um, make their voices heard enough. So. If the EU has a, a natural seat at the G20, the African Union has not, and it's due to the fact that it's politically not strong enough, that it can make its voice heard. So is it just us not wanting you at the table, or are you not pushing enough at the door? You know, um, you, you claim your space. Uh, it's a struggle, so I don't think it's for anybody else to struggle on our behalf. So it, ca it has to go both ways. We cannot say, we don't like to be patronized. But can you please fight for us and create a space for us? So it goes together. Africans have to fight for their own space. And they don't. And therefore, it's our fault first. But that doesn't mean we are not going to denounce it. OK. <laughs> we wait. <laughs> Let me ask the second killer question. When, when we talk about development, quite often you hear from people, the Chinese got it right, the Asians got it right, they got their part of the value chain, the Africans just didn't. So it's not our fault, it's not the fault of the West of the G20, it's the African fault. What do you answer them, besides all the numbers that you... The Chinese got it right, thanks to their genius and uh, a lot of characteristics that are unique to them but also because there was a need to delocalize most of the manufacturing into where you know, the conditions were more attractive, including labor costs. The Chinese are now going to face the same music that the Europeans and the um, United States and others faced before. Their labor costs have risen significantly. They tried to automate as much as they could, but still, it's not enough. There are costs that will be prohibitive, and therefore they want to delocalize as well. They can delocalize in many parts of the world, as they are doing, but they can also delocalize one part in the direction of Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's also what they are doing. So I don't think Africa is going to be either uh, privileged by this delocalization from China, neither is going to be neglected. It's going to have a slice. How big is that slice going to be? It depends on how Africans get organized and how they structure themselves. Some countries are ahead of others. They will get more. Um, I once uh, discussed with a Chinese senior official, and I said to him, people criticize China. I just wanted to have the reaction. People criticize China because you basically come with a, uh, turnkey projects and you know it's your labor that come and you occupy basically a, a labor space 
and there's nothing that is really left to the country. So this is the sort of perception that we cultivated about the Chinese, and there was some truth, you know, about 15 years ago. Today, about 85% of the infrastructure projects that China handles in the continent as, uh, or rather 85% of the labor of those projects is African, and about 40% of the management is African, which means that they are creating jobs. And what people don't realize is that about one third of their proper foreign direct investment is on, on manufacturing. So things have changed, but what he said at the time, this senior official, is very revealing. He said to me, we learn. We are going to learn. And you know, I discounted that. You know, here we are, 15 years later, they have learned. And uh, what is really bothering me is that they have learned partly because some countries made it clear that this was not tolerable, this was not possible. They put in place regulation and policies to make it impossible for them to operate under those terms. But others did not. And you can see the difference. Just go around the countries and you see how the Chinese behave in Ethiopia and how they behave in Congo Brazzaville. It's a completely different behavior. Would you also, I mean, you have, to be, you have been very critical of, of the, the German compact, our plans for Africa. Would you then argue that we are not able to learn? I, I just checked all the plans for Africa that we had during the last 20 years. You, you, you can't count them. It's so many where we wanted to help you, always with this attitude, we helping you, and now comes the next one. So are we unable to learn? Are our governments unable to learn? Or would you actually argue they're just not really interested? This is more internal kind of communication that we do something about the world. Well, you know your political system better than I do. Uh, I, I would just say this. The Marshall Plan numbers that are announced, I understand that now the name is changing. Yeah, they don't call it Marshall Plan officially yes. any longer. There was too much criticism. I said several times, it's the equivalent to the budget of a mid-sized city in Germany. So if you want to compare Africa with a mid-sized city, <laughs> that's OK. We, we get the point. <laughs> <laughs> There's also this, this other plan, the compact, the G20 thing. What's your comment about that one? Basically the same? Well, it's a bit more uh, sophisticated in its approach, but I think the, the emphasis is right in some aspects. So let's not throw the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. There are elements about uh, you know, creating the, the, the conducive environment uh, in terms of regulations, in terms of creating space for institutional funds, and all those things that are very attractive. The problem is that the context is much more complex than these documents want to acknowledge. And that's what I was trying to, to drive at. That you know, if you have uh, a situation where the financial regulations uh, prevailing in the world are creating disincentives, if you have a situation where negative interest rates are establishing new standards for risk, uh, if you have uh, a number of other factors that I delineated, it's obvious that what we have in the compact is not going to work. Just a final question before I'm going to open it up for, for this great audience. I know you worked with Kofi Annan. If you were Kofi Annan and if you had the, the money the IMF can, could spend, um, if you had also a certain power, what kind of plan would you draw? Or would you draw none and just say, forget about the plans? Well, the Africans have their own aspirational plan, mm -hmm. which is Agenda 2063. And because I was also involved in, in that process, I would say that's the plan that the Africans constructed. Therefore, that's the one they want. It will be very easy to re cross-reference uh, that document and pretend that is completely compatible. Uh, because we are used to these exercises of cross-referencing. It's very common. What but do you mean by cross-references? You create a different document, but you say in every other paragraph, Agenda 2063, 
uh, etc. So you give the impression that actually you are absolutely compatible. You have cross-referenced the mm -hmm. document, but you have actually not really done what is uh, necessary. For me, there is an incredible important role that development aid should play nowadays in Africa. And that role is to create and multiply the domestic resource capabilities of the countries. You know, if you really invest in improving our tax collection systems, if we you could invest improve in ours as well. <laughs> if you invest in making sure that our customs are going to be compatible with the European Union standards on commodity pricing that allow for an European customs official to know whether there is an under-reporting mm -hmm. of uh, the merchandises that are getting into the country, et cetera, et cetera. You are multiplying our resources and, and enabling us to make our own decisions with our own money. As I said, just 1% efficiency gain is more than aid. That's where the money should go. It's not patronizing, it's efficiency related, and it's based on best practices anywhere in the world. If you think that a country like DRC, every time it has elections, the international community, which is an euphemism, puts about half billion dollars for the voters' role in the elections to be run. And when they leave, the country still doesn't have people with a civil registration and ID. And then five years later, another alpha billion. And again, the same story. What is the logic of this? You know, you were talking about informal sector, making sure that you modernize the, the country, not just the economy. It starts with that. It starts with, you know, having some tracking of people from when they are born until they are dead. You cannot run a country where you don't know where your population is and you know what, where they are. Mm -hmm. They how don't have any- How many schools you need, how many hospitals you need. Yes, mm -hmm. everything. You can't plan, you can't strategize, you can't modernize. And you know, I found it really strange that after 30 years of development aid, this issue is not yet addressed. Mm. We should start by what is essential. <laughs> Thank you, that sounds so logic that you wonder why nobody's going there. Let me, let me open the, the debate for you. I think there should be um, microphones somewhere. Maybe we have a couple of guests from Africa. Is there anybody who would like to, to add something to what we, what we heard? Sir, is there a microphone? There's a microphone in the back. The, if you could just present yourself briefly so that we know where you come from, what's your perspective? Thank you. My name is Tony Carbo, and I'm from um, the Center for Conflict Resolution in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I am very much impressed by the presentation Carlos has given. Um, the, the figures, um, even though they are you know, depressing in, in certain areas, um, tend to be um, tend to have some type of veracity to them. Um, I am wondering, however, uh, that um, throughout the presentation, it seems um, that Carlos is um, pointing the finger elsewhere as um, the, the problems belong somewhere other than uh, within uh, the continent itself. Um, if uh, most of the African countries have been independent for at least um, uh, most of them for more than 50 years, uh, I, you know, I, I seem to wonder, is there some responsibility we must be uh, given to us um, Africans? Do we have any responsibility at all for um, the conditions in which we find ourselves? Um, I remember um, a few years ago, I think it was in 2011, uh, when the wave of revolutions, you know, started in North Africa, and um, at the time uh, there was um, a call for the ousting of, um, you know, the Libyan leader, 
And I remember in the, in the UN, uh, there was a hot debate for the Africans themselves, you know, really, who were sitting in the Security Council, were the first people to, um, you know, support a motion to oust, um, the, the, you know, Gaddafi. Um, I, I wonder whether or not our leaders have some responsibility in terms of governance. Uh, you just gave the example of um, DR Congo. Um, since 1961 or 1963 when they got their independence, I mean, can't they really structure some system uh, where they can themselves uh, with all the resources they have, you know, um, get a, a, a register for voters for God's sake. I mean, they, they make enough a lot of money in terms of, you know, the extractive um, industries. Uh, I mean, you can uh, name all okay. kinds of issues, um, but uh, my, my question basically, uh, Carlos, is, is there any responsibility that we must take for ourselves um, on the continent? Carlos, you want to respond directly? Maybe we could collect some... Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I am Martin Sunke, coming from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add my comment to what uh, Carlos just presented. I don't want to get the pretension of giving an answer to what my brother just asked there. I will leave it to Carlos. But I think uh, Carlos was clear enough to say we also have our responsibility in this. And we do have a responsibility in that. My comment is not about that. My comment is about the cross-referencing mm -hmm. of Agenda 2063. This is crucial, and I think Carlos did not go deep into that. And this is where we should be discussing. When you say you are doing any compact or Marshall Plan or whatever for Africa or with Africa, you can do it without Africans discussing it with you. And Africans have already discussed what they expect from anyone. And that's what is prescribed in the Agenda 2063. You don't just have to say you are going to do this in the agenda, that in the agenda, without really going to understand the agenda with Africans, because they are the ones who should explain the agenda to anyone who wants to come and join in implementing the agenda. And I think that's what we should be discussing here. We should be discussing Africans' expectation before we propose any plan for or with Africans. Thank you, Carlos, for the presentation. Thank you very much. Maybe you can just hand the, the, the microphone to the lady in front of you, and then we go to the right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Claudia Simons from the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Thanks, Carlos, uh, for this very enlightening speech. Um, I have one question. When we talk about investment, be it in the initiatives here in Germany or globally, we talk a lot about boosting job creation. And you mentioned China and you know, uh, cost, labor costs rising, so maybe there's going to be a share on like, outsourcing labor also to African countries. And I want to ask you, do you really want to have sweatshops in Kenya? So Because when we talk about boosting job creation, are we talking about dignified working conditions, or are we only talking about very low costs of labor? What about social security? What about human rights? And so on and so forth. How do you see the future of that in, in Africa? Mm -hmm. Maybe we take one more and then we, you could give it to Nancy and then we go to the center in the next round. Thank you for the wonderful speech. Um, Last month, uh, the president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, gave a speech at London School of Economics where he s said his dream was that one day UK pensioners or pensioners who are like invested in roads, say in Dar es Salaam, are supported by the people paying those tolls. And you know, I thought about it, and so people in Dar es Salaam paid tolls for 30 years, and all that, or so much of that revenue goes to UK pensioners, because we all know, I mean, OECD pensions are 30 trillion, and Africans are, African pensions are 400 billion. And I just wondered what you think about this as a source of, 
of finance because that's what the Continental Business Network for Africa really wants is all this pension fund money, but will it drain Africa or will it help? Who? just a couple of pretty dense questions. Yes. Very interesting questions. I'm going to respond uh, fast because I see that others want to intervene. And I agree with a lot of the comments that were made. Uh, maybe the, it's a matter of emphasis, but I'm absolutely with you that the responsibility, first and foremost, belongs to the Africans. And the Africans have to make their leaders accountable for the things that have not happened. And they don't do it enough. Uh, and we, we need to also, through discussions and through information, make sure that this accountability is improved because people get more information, they know what to ask. So the ask part is missing uh, because there is not enough information. But uh, DRC is a bad example that you picked. You should have picked another one. Because DRC has a peacekeeping mission that has been there for 57 years. Five, seven. 57 years. What the heck are they doing there for 57 years? <laughs> you should ask that question. And then, you know, it will explain a lot of other things, including why there are no uh, civil registration uh, records and the rest. Um, but I think it doesn't preclude the need for us to make our leaders accountable. You know, we are absolutely on the same page there. Um, boosting job creation uh, has a lot to do with uh, understanding that part of the movement of people um, from, let's say, the rural parts of India, uh, of China, towards the coast has uh, reached its peak. And therefore, the, 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 the cheap labor that the manufacturing leaders in China could benefit from within China is coming to an end. And it's coming to an end because uh, of also evolution of the society and the fact that now they have also uh, social security costs and uh, all kinds of associated costs. And I would argue that Africa has to have a level of ambition that is commensurate with where it starts in this process of integrating complex value chains. If we try to reach, this is one area where we cannot leapfrog, if we try to reach to the best security, social security system, these jobs are not going to come to Africa. I want them to come to Africa, and I know that it's going to be in a system where Africans will be shortchanged at the beginning. But it is still interesting enough because it's better than the informality and the precarity that we are witnessing right now. You have to be um, uh, very realistic in terms of the level of ambition according to the progress you make. For instance, this will not be acceptable in a country where the social security system has already become quite sophisticated. Let's say South Africa. But it is absolutely possible for countries where the minimum wage is less than $60. And, and therefore, you, know, you, you have to be capable of absorbing by waves what comes with this type of attractiveness. Uh, you can't get it all in one go. Um, Justin Lin, uh, who is the former chief economist of the World Bank and the, the brains behind uh, some of these developments uh, in relation to Africa in the China policy, says that about 84 million jobs will migrate out of China. And he estimates that about 30 million jobs may come to Africa over time. I don't know whether this is going to happen or not. You know, his, his hypothesis is very attractive. But what I know is that these 30 million jobs are going to be at the very low end of the scale. 
Um, so the Chinese will no longer produce plastics, uh, toys, and you name it, uh, because it will be cheaper to do it in Africa, and it will be cheaper than doing it with robots. And that's, that's the reality. Once you get into the value chains, then you can increase your value addition, and you can have ambitions that right now are just prohibitive and are not just available to Africa. Um, cross-referencing, yes, cross-referencing is uh, international relations um, habit these days. So we cross-reference everything, and we don't pay too much attention to what policy implications are. But the role of think tanks, like this uh, meeting that is taking place here in Berlin, organized around the think tanks, the T20, is precisely to address uh, those gaps. Um, I think uh, the issue of uh, pension funds, well, I'm actually very happy that uh, Africans have $400 billion of uh, pension fund money because $400 billion of pension fund money could have been used in incredible ways favorable to, to, to the tra economic transformation of the continent, and they are not. It's the same with the remittances for migrants that are now at 61 billion, and they are not used properly. It's the same with commercial banks that have more than $80 billion sitting hidden. We can go on with the list. In fact, that list brought us to a figure that I publicized uh, four years ago of about $1 trillion that were available for investment in Africa, from Africa, if the right things were done. But again, we go back to the issue of leadership. You know, if you, typically, people are fighting in any given country in Africa to be a minister rather than the president of the pension fund. Uh, when the pension fund is where the money is, uh, and it's completely run down and not properly managed and with a com complete disaster. And yet, some of the best asset managers in the world are actually African. You know, you have South African asset managers that are dealing with management of assets from around the world because of their expertise, and we don't use it. I think I'll take another round of, of questions. Would you whisk the microphone? Could you just give it to the sir in the second row? Uh, good evening. My name is Winston Asuchuk from Nigeria. Uh, when I listened to the figures you gave about the, uh, the perception problem that Africa has, it sets me back to something that I did. I used to run securities and asset management for EcoBank. And my first day at work, we had a strategy meeting. And I asked the question, why isn't every transaction that is done in sub-Saharan Africa done with echo dollars, since we're everywhere? And from that conversation, we went out and we did some research to figure out exactly what you said. And we created an index that is currently available on Bloomberg called the Middle Africa Bond Index. Everything you said showed up in glaring colors. Africa was, le was less risky than the JP Morgan Emerging Market Bond Index. Oh, wow. Gave a higher return, and here's the kicker, was almost negatively correlated, which means that dollar for dollar, an investment in local currency bonds in Africa would not only give you a higher return, but will save, will add as an insurance policy on the rest of your portfolio if you had invested in Africa. So when, when we saw those numbers and we tried to push, that is, the, that is the big perception I think that's missing. And I think it's up to us to get that message out as hard as possible. Again, we are talking about perceptions. But could, could you just answer me the question, why is then Africa itself not building up this financial sector that then could use the money in Africa? Well, I, I, will, I will say this much. Uh, based on what, uh, from my personal perspective, mm -hmm. is this. I look at my parents who came into adulthood in the 70s. And 
I look at how life changed for them from about 75, 76 to the mid 80s. The complete destruction of value and, and, and the complete destruction of value that happened with hyperinflation across, across Africa systematically changed the way people looked at money and investments. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, it has moved people from being able to look three, four, five years down the road to looking right in front of them. And in fact, I gave this same speech to, I had a meeting with uh, Shlom Bouget. I gave them a, a presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I asked them a simple question. Do you have a five-year strategic plan? And everybody laughs and goes, of course we do. We renew it every year. I'm like, for your company? They said, yes. Then the simple question was, then why do you invest as if you're going to die tomorrow? Every single investment is done in Africa based on almost a 365-day cycle. We renew a total investment portfolio every 365 days. You cannot make any change economically in a society if you have to refinance everything every 365 days. It's not possible. OK, thanks. <laughs> Could you hand over the microphone to the, to the next to you? Yeah, and then uh, we? Um, uh, I think uh, this may have been said, but I would really reiterate the question again. Um, sorry, my name is Kari Bulkar. Thank I'm you. the chairman of Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Um, I think it's Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, said character is your destiny. Your character is your destiny. Um, is there something that is flawed in the African character that 50, 60 years after independence, therefore we shouldn't be holding on to colonial history, we've been free, so to speak. And if you go through the African map, you see a lot of wave of democratic settings that have gone through years, if not decades, of de democratic setup. However, there is no, no correlation whatsoever between the standard of living and the governance structure so far attained. Is it something of a character flaw? Well, now let me ask you something. It's getting hot. We are running out of time. Should I take two, three more questions? Or would you, you look like it's really interesting? I think so too. Those two, the sir just in the back, and then the sir, and then we go to you. And then we go back to. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bekela, I come from Ethiopia. I think I can understand uh, what the guy tries to say, whether the problem lies in the African leadership or not. You know, we are discussing, you know, about two different things. You know, Africa is the most raped continent in the world, slavery, colonialism. And from the 1960 on, all the economic policies import services, industrialization, basic needs, structural adjustment programs. All these policies came from outside without being discussed in Africa. All the theoretical models, policies, were developed in Europe. I, uh, I'm not sure whether the African leadership, the political elite, the economic elite, do understand all these economic policies like mercantilism, like Keynesianism, like uh, classical economics, like uh, neoclassical economics, like uh, uh, neoliberalism, and so on and so on, you know. You know, without, you know, exhaustively discussing all these kinds of things, you know, within the African continent, you know, if things are come from outside without having understood, if we practice them, you know, the side effect is too much negative. And you tried, you know, to you know, portray the image of Africa too much positively. I don't see it like that, you know. Africa is, you know, in all terms, you know, if you see the state system in Africa, it was an imposed state system. It's not organically grown like in the European state systems, you know, from the Renaissance, from the Enlightenment, and so on and so on, you know. 
we all lack all these kinds of you know state building systems you know what we call it enlightenment you know that is a problem what many african countries to face and from this perspective i think we have to discuss it you know from an entirely different perspective if we bring a genuine development in african countries in each african countries in each african country then we can go on to pan africanism on whatever you want to say thank you very much thank you Thank you. Yeah. This. Could you be brief? So that you can I'm come always back? brief. Thank you. Thank Heine you. Banking, Council of Global Issues, and Global Commons Alliance within UN ECOSOC. First, I enjoyed your jungling with numbers, but I wondered, or would you agree, that when to compare, we need for density, scales, proportions, consequences, we need fidelity and equal area maps. So you see all these maps are not to scale. Asia is three times bigger than Af Africa. So this is my first thing. My second, have you studied the fate and learnings after Africa Beyond Poverty? We organized with Odera Uruka 95 in Nairobi. So there we had Gandhi Society, Bishop Tutu, the Dutch government, and all the Scandinav Scandinavians on desk. So is there a study? about the failures, I would like to look at it. And last, they always say, with and for Africa. Have you heard about the motion of light in Africa? And light also in our minds. It was done four days here in Germany to really show the intersectorial strategic dilemmas and how to link bottom up the SDGs. I couldn't make it shorter. Thank you. Now we take. Two more, the one in the first row and the, so in the second, and then we come back to you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that inspiring um, talk. Uh, Julia Leininger from the German Development Institute. I have actually three short questions. The first one is, what is your vision? Let's imagine that the risk perception is overcome, the problem of the risk, risk perception. And investments are there. The taxes are there. Will the life of people be better? Hmm. Second, um, when you refer to political governance and voice, you refer to the G21 and uh, with an African seat, which I, I really do favor as well. My question would be, um, what does political governance need to look like within the countries? And since you talked about accountability and at the same time said China is on the right way, I'd be, because my feeling is that account holding the government accountable in China is quite difficult. <laughs> so uh, my question would be, what is that political governance that is needed in, in Africa? And my third question, as a, as a <laughs> social scientist, I'd really I'd like to know where you get your data from, because <laughs> I do see, see the same data problems. <laughs> you open your sources afterward. So final question. Nigerian Economic Summit Group. And my question is with the, I just want to take you on the first topic, the issue of risk perception. Whether it's within the German plan or the G20 plan, it's about how do we leverage private capital to fund what is it we need in Africa. But if you have this risk perception, that will make banks and private capital not to come. What must we be doing now? How can we as Africans begin to engage and confront those perceptions so that we change things? And now the answer in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm quite used to being pushed back as an optimist. But I absolutely refuse that, because I don't think it is about me being optimist. It's about the deficit of perception being so huge that when you say things that sound different, people think you are being an optimist. So my challenge, my challenge is for you to go and check every data that I mention here. Because it's not like, uh, Julia, they are secret. Uh, it's just because we don't use them the way I'm using it, with comparators in, in two ways. Comparators historically and geographically. And when you do that, it's a very simple exercise. 
immediately you discover things that normally are not perceptible. Like, for instance, if I say that um, Africa has doubled its GDP in 15 years and China did the same, go check, it's there. You have the historical dimension and you have also the geographical dimension. Uh, but people don't do those types of exercises. Well, I was fortunate enough to work for five years leading the Economic Commission for Africa. For those who don't know, is the UN development uh, policy structure for the continent. It's based in Addis Ababa. It has 1,000 people. It has 300 economists. It has 60 statisticians. So I could really put these people to work. They hate me, probably. <laughs> And I made sure that during my leadership, I was going to extract the type of data that allows me to speak the way I do. So, and I think it's nothing secret, it's just about making these comparators alive and making sure that we understand, you know, that Africa cannot be seen in isolation. So I will start by challenging you with your map. You said that Africa is much smaller than, than, than Asia. That's an evidence. But what is not so clear for people is that everybody uses the Mercator projection, including Google, including Google, that was established in the 17th century because of navigation you know, requirements that basically shortchanges Africa so much that it puts us almost at the size of the Groenland. <laughs> and you know, it is so pervasive as a problem of perception that Africa is much bigger than people think. It's the US, China, India, all of Western Europe, and parts of uh, uh, other parts of uh, the world, like Japan, etc. included. That's not what people think. That if you were just two weeks ago in the African Development Bank annual assembly that was in Ahmedabad, you would see that the logo of the conference is two maps, the map of Africa and the map of India. Guess what? Same size. <laughs> Yet, the, the real size is that India is the equivalent of the Horn of Africa. So you see, who is, who is shortchanged? Not me, because I, I compared with China. I didn't compare with Asia. Uh, I can compare with Asia, actually, by saying this much. Africa is the continent that grows the most in the world right now, because that's true in continental terms. Because if you include all of Asia, you have a lot of losers and a lot of non-performers. But that's not what is done by international organizations. They isolate the good Asia from the bad Asia. And the same for conflict. Much more people are affected by conflict in Asia much more casualties. You, know, you just need to look into Syria or before Afghanistan and so on. But that's not what we do. So yes, I, 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 I know how to compare Africa with Asia favorably, but that's not what I did. What I did was to compare with China, and I explained it was for demographic reasons. And, and that I stick my, to my position, because I think it's very relevant. And it's a motivation for Africans to know that historically, about 30 years ago, the GDP per capita of China was lower than what Africa has right now. So if they did it, why not? We can do it as well. Now, I think that the issue of whether we should uh, just juxtapose the national realities in the way I did, which is the question that came from my uh, brother from Ethiopia. Well, uh, my very clear historical uh, social scientist background tells me that what you said about Europe is not true. Maybe it's true for Africa, but since you, re you cross-referenced, you cross-referenced, <laughs> you cross-referenced Europe, it's, it's not valid as a point because most of the states in Europe were not created out of enlightenment. They were created out of wars. They were created out of conflicts. Uh, and the Westphalian process is there to show how the separation between church and state was done. 
and then the states were not constituted on the basis of ethnic unification that came afterwards. So what is true for Europe actually is true for Africa. So you have to choose whether you want us to look bad by comparing with that Europe, or you want us to look good by saying we are actually quite different. We are doing better than Europe did then. <laughs> uh, another point that I think it's very important is to these policy models, you know, I absolutely believe that the reason we have not made more progress is because the policy models were adopted by the leadership of Africa uncritically. So it is the problem of the leadership of the continent that has been very fast in adopting, say, consumption patterns. They love champagne. They love the Mercedes. They have no problems that champagne comes from France and the Mercedes come from Germany. But they will not adopt you know, some characteristics that are linked to institution building in France or efficiency engineering in Germany. So we adopt uncritically uh, the policies and therefore you know, we pick the ones that are easy and we don't deal with the ones that are difficult. So we should not really take this for granted that you know, it's all about imposition and so on. I'm not so sure that the colonial model is over. Because if you look into the infrastructure, it's all about ports and roads around the coast to bring something from where the mines are. So we are not yet completely out of it. Uh, but definitely, I will never say that this is now done because the colonial influence is there. It's done because we are uncritical and we are not capable of taking the right decisions. So who forbids us from taking them? And you have examples of countries that are doing the right thing, and guess what? They actually get more aid, not less. They insult, they criticize, they say this is not what we want, and so on. They get even more aid than the, the ones that are just clapping. So, I mean, there is very clear lessons there that we should, uh, we should do things differently. And that's my vision. Basically, my vision is that we have to have the real ownership. You know, when we talk about ownership, it's, it's a very easy catch-all concept. There is ownership of the idea. There is ownership of a process. There is ownership of the financial means. There is ownership of the evaluation and accountability. There is ownership of the policy. There are many forms of ownership. And normally, what we do is to discuss ownership in such vague terms that everybody can get away with just keeping things the way they are. Whose fault? In this case, the protagonism has to come from the Africans. It's about African agency. And if the African agency is going to be exercised, what I'm claiming is that it has to start with better knowledge and context. And if you don't have the better knowledge and context that I'm trying to proclaim is absolutely fundamental, is absolutely essential, it's a premise for everything that we do thereafter, we are bound to have failure because it basically means we have not done our homework. And what I'm trying to instill as an attitude, it's basically an attitude, you said character, is, is that type of attitude. And I hope that it's not going to be something that we ask others to do for Africa. It's something that Africans have to do, not only for themselves, but for the world. Because Africa is part of the solution. I mentioned at the very beginning of my intervention the issue of demographics, but I didn't actually elaborate on it. This year, in the celebration of the centennial uh, that the Japanese do every year, the number of nominees were 32,000. These are people with 100 years completed during the last four years. They join another 30,000. That means you have in Japan 62,000 people that are 100 years or older. 
by 2050, they are going to jump to half a million. And by the end of the century, they are going to be close to two million. These are the projections. Now, they have 200% GDP to debt ratio. Who is going to pay for this? Who is going to pay for this incredible development, demographically speaking? Some people say robots. Robots paying social security, robots paying pension funds, good luck. <laughs> I actually think there's nothing else to say. I, I thank you. I'm pretty well known for being a tight moderator with my, the, the timetable. I overstepped my my borders, <laughs> so to say, this evening because I really enjoyed listening to you, and I think the audience did as well. So the only thing I can still do is to invite you downstairs to a drink and, and, and a snack and to thank you very much for your enlightening speech. Thanks. Thank you.